Hello my friends, and welcome back to my channel. This is Voice of Persona, and today we will be continuing my reading of Game of Thrones lore. Uh, we last left off after reading about um, Robert's Rebellion, and I've decided to cut it into two pieces, into two parts, so that we could extend the video a little bit and digest some of the information that was presented given the fact that the finale is this Sunday I figured it would be a perfect opportunity for me to wrap up the uh, lore prior to the start of the Game of Thrones series so got my phone Right here handy. And I'm just going to be reading off the rest of the lore that remains. There's about four different stories left to read. And we're going to continue with the Greyjoy Rebellion. So, Game of Thrones fans, connoisseurs, and those that do not care for the series, please. Sit back, relax, grab yourself a cold beverage or a nice pillow, whatever you prefer, depending on the time of day it is, and get ready to learn some more stuff about Game of Thrones, because we can never, ever get enough. Here we go. The Greyjoy Rebellion was a brief uprising in the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, fought between House Greyjoy, rulers of the Iron Islands, and the Iron Throne. <clears throat> the rebellion took place nine years before the beginning of the series, and was an attempt by House Greyjoy of the Iron Islands to break away and secure independence from the Iron Throne and revive the old way. Balon, Balon Greyjoy declared himself king of the Iron Islands, forged the kingdom of the Iron Islands, and led the rebellion, supported by his vassals. The rebellion began eight years after King Robert uh, Baratheon seized the Iron Throne in the Civil War, known as Robert's Rebellion. During the rebellion, House Greyjoy secured several early victories including the burning of the Lannister fleet at anchor in Lannisport in a raid led by Euron Greyjoy. They raided all along the western coast of Westeros, as far north as Sea Dragon Point. Their first major defeat came in an attempted attack on the coastal castle of Seaguard. Balon's first son and heir, Roderick, was killed in the failed assault. However, the superiority of numbers and resources saw the Iron Throne crush the rebellion. The Greyjoy fleet was destroyed by Lord Stannis Baratheon. King Robert and his warden of the north, Lord Eddard Stark, besieged the Greyjoy stronghold of Pike. The Iron Islands were outnumbered 10 to 1. During the final assault on Pike, a battle-crazed warrior priest of the Lord of Light named Thoros of Myr led the way through a breach in the wall with his flaming sword, Jorah Mormont of Bear Island, not far behind him. Eddard Stark and Jaime Lannister were also key fighters for the Iron Throne during the battle. Balon's second son, Maeron Greyjoy, or Maron Greyjoy, I'm not really sure, was killed in the fighting at Pike. Maron's death was due to a collapsing tower during the battle. You can also see a picture here that says Balon bends the knee, sig signaling the end of the reign. Let me see if I can get that in here. 
my phone acts up sometimes, so if it doesn't go through, then, you know, I think I have my camera set on only recognizing my face, so forgive me. I'm still in the learning process with this camera, but um, I'll get better, I promise. Anyway, so the rebellion was crushed, and Balon was forced to surrender. He was accepted back into the king's peace, keeping his lordship and titles but only on the condition that his last surviving son, Theon, be made a ward of House Stark as hostage for his good behavior. Theon was just eight years old at the time. Robert's victory cemented his hold on the throne. After having thrown, overthrown the Targaryens a few years before, King Robert knighted Jorah Mormont, for his valor in the battle. Jory Castle also fought in the Greyjoy Rebellion. And then there's some stuff about Season 1 and Season 7, etc. But I'm not going to read that just in case that you uh, are watching this and you haven't seen possibly Season 7. Um, it is... I think we're up to Season 8. I forget which number, but... I don't want to spoil anything, so, but, um, yeah, I was actually not sure, um, I'm re-watching the series, and I'm, I'm re-watching season one currently, and I really wasn't sure why Theon was there in the first place, but now this makes a lot of sense, because I was just like, he's not a Stark, why is he even, you know, involved, he's from the Iron Islands, but this makes a lot of sense, so, that explains a lot. It was probably mentioned in the series as well, but I, you know, you can miss things because there's a lot of information to take in, a lot of characters, and it's craziness, really. So, it is what it is. But, uh, fuck, I clicked on an ad. <laughs> God damn it. Let's, uh, continue. Also, Yes, I will be doing a mix of whispering and soft speaking. I feel like I do a lot of um, whispering, but not enough soft speaking. So, if you guys like my soft speaking voice, well, let me know. Because it's a lot easier than whispering for 40 minutes. I'm uh, personally a fan of both, depending on the person. But I do like soft speaking. It's, uh, it's nice. All right, now we're at War of the Five Kings. The War of the Five Kings was a major civil war in the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros that erupted in the wake of the death of King Robert. In essence, the war was a three-way battle for the Iron Throne, fought alongside two independence movements. The five kings in question were Robert's heir, apparent Joffrey Baratheon, Robert's two younger brothers, Stannis and Renly Baratheon, and King in the North, Rob Stark, and the King of the Iron Islands, Balon Greyjoy. And, uh, of course, this, is, this takes place in the actual series. So, if this doesn't sound familiar to you, it may be a spoiler. And you should stop listening now. Don't worry about the ASMR. There will be other videos. I'm just letting you know now. I don't want to spoil anything for you. So, no hard feelings. Don't worry about it. But if you know about all of this, then we're fine. Upon Robert Baratheon's death, his heir apparent, Prince Joffrey Baratheon, takes the Iron Throne. However, the revelation that his brother and sister are bastards born of incest between Queen Consort Cersei and her twin brother, Sir Jaime Lannister, leads both of Robert's younger brothers, Stannis and Renly Baratheon, to claim the throne for themselves. Stannis sees himself as the rightful heir by right of blood, being Robert's heir with the removal of Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen from the line of secession due to them being bastards born of incest. Renly claims 
the throne on the basis that he would be a better king, despite being second to status in the lawful line of succession. Meanwhile, Robstar, Lord of Winterfell, is declared the king in the north by his bannermen in the wake of the execution of his father, Eddard Stark, on false charges by treason, on false charges of treason by Joffrey. Rob has been in command of a host marching so south uh, to free the, his then imprisoned father and to re relieve the Lannister attack on the Riverlands. Excuse me for a second. everyone, the whole conflict was instigated by Peter Baelish, and master, the Master of Coin, with help of Lysa Aaron, who poisoned her husband, John Aaron, and the king, to Robert Baratheon, and sent a letter to her sister, Catelyn Stark, claiming that it was the Lannisters who poisoned her husband. Peter, from the small house Baelish, ignited the war in order to gain more powerful more power for himself. By 303 AL, all of the original five kings were assassinated or killed in battle, leading to the complete end of the war of the five kings. And, uh, the stage was set for the war when Catelyn Stark seized Tyrion Lannister at the crossroads inn and accused him of attempted murder of her son, Bran, based on claims made by Peter Baelish. Peter Baelish. Bran had previously been crippled by Sir Jamie Lannister after he caught Jamie having sex with his sister. I just, I want to emphasize that because it's funny. <clears throat> and the king's wife, Queen Cersei Lannister, Though he had no memory of this. Which I never understood. I don't know if it was explained, but I don't think it was. House Lannister, led by Lord Tywin Lannister, summoned its armies and marched on the Riverlands, ruled by House Tully. <coughs> Catelyn's house, Catelyn's house, with 60,000 men. Sir Gregor Clegane, led an auxiliary force and began striking at banner houses, supporting Catelyn's father, Lord Hoster Tully, in reprisal. The death of Robert Baratheon. King Robert attempted to defuse the situation, but failed, and soon after died. Immediately upon hearing of his brother's death, and having failed to win the support of Eddard Stark, the hand of the king in securing the throne for himself, Renly Baratheon, fled King's Landing with his lover, Sir Loras Tyrell, the heir to the Reach, and rode hard for Highgarden, Highgarden, 
Prince Joffrey Baratheon immediately claimed the thrones, the throne upon Robert's death, with his mother's backing. However, Eddard Stark had learned from research by John Arryn, the previous hand of the king, who had been assassinated by Littlefinger, though seemingly by the Lannisters, that Joffrey and his siblings were not Robert's children at all. They were bastards, born of incest between Queen Cersei and her own brother, Sir Jaime. Lord Eddard had a proclamation written by King Robert, which named him Regent and Protector of the Realm, but it was ignored by Queen Cersei, whom Eddard had unwi unwisely forewarned of his knowing the truth about her children. When Eddard tried to take Joffrey into custody as an imposter, Joffrey, who had been forewarned by Lord Baelish, had Eddard arrested. Littlefinger held Eddard with a dagger to his throat, while Janos Slint had the city watch turn on Lord Eddard's household guards. The Lannister soldiers finished off the rest of the Stark household in King's Landing. Unfortunately for Joffrey, he was unaware that Eddard had already sent a letter to Robert's brother, Lord Stannis Baratheon, telling him that Joffrey was not legitimate and the crown belonged to Stannis by right. He was also unaware that Renly knew this and was gathering his supporters in the Stormlands and the Reach. On Dragonstone, Stannis likewise claimed the throne and began gathering his own supporters. The Lannister forces separated into two armies of 30,000 men each. Sir Jaime Lannister led one force with the aim of capturing River Run, the principal stronghold of House Tully. Jaime smashed the River Lords at the Battle of the Golden Tooth and followed through on his victory by laying siege to River Run. Lord Tywin Lannister led the other force himself. Jamie's victories allowed him to move northwest through the Riverlands unimpeded. Receiving news of his father's arrest and a demand that he come to King's Landing and recognize Joffrey as the king, Rob Stark mobilized the armies of the north and assembled a host of 20,000 men. Due to the urgency of the situation and the vast of the north, he could not wait for more. He marched to the relief of the Riverlands, which were ruled by his maternal family, House Tully. Lord Tywin moved to the east bank of the Green Fork of Trident to intercept the Storm Force. Even winning that support of House Frey and its troops, despite the phrase being Tully Bannerman, Banners, Bannerman, could not bring Rob's forces up to parity uh, with the Lannisters, but it gave Rob an advantage in transportation and local intelligence. Rob sent 2,000 men to pretend to attack Tywin's army. As planned, the small force was destroyed at the Battle of the Green Fork, but it delayed the Lannisters long enough for Rob's main army to slip past them into the Whispering Wood near River Run. There, Rob staged a feint to draw Jamie Lannister and a portion of his army uh, into the woodlands. During the Battle of the Whispering Wood, Rob inflicted a significant defeat upon the Lannisters, destroying much of Jamie's host and capturing the Kingslayer himself. Receiving word of Jamie's defeat, Tywin realized. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm tired of myself. <clears throat> Tywin realized that the Starks and the Tullys were now free to unify against him, potentially breaking, bringing much greater numbers uh, to bear against the smaller force. He retreated to Arenal, the formidable castle on the north banks of the God's Eye, intending to fortify uh, it and use it as a base of operation to conduct raids in the Riverlands. There is a... There is actually a lot this part. I did not foresee this, but um, we'll keep going. Um, the Rise of the Kings. By this time, new 
news of Renly and Stannis gathering armies had reached both the Stark and Lannister camps. Both men had claimed the Iron Throne. Stannis asked which should heir after his brother's death and Renly on the claim that he could be a better king than his brothers. Meanwhile, in King's Landing, Eddard Stark confessed to treason and recognized Joffrey as the king in an attempt by the small council to reach a truce with the Starks and allow them to deal with the Baratheons. Eddard Stark uh, was convinced to do this project to, pr to protect his daughter, Sansa, who was held in King's Landing as a hostage. Expected move, Joffrey ordered Eddard's execution instead of allowing him to join the Night's Watch. Eddard's death caused the vengeful Northmen to reject the authority of the Iron Throne. After considering joining forces with one of the Baratheon brothers, the Northmen and the River Lords chose the path of independence, rejecting the authority of the Iron Throne altogether and swearing fealty to Robb Stark as king in the North. King Robb Stark followed up on his success at the Whispering Wood with several minor skirmishes against Lanner Lannister forces, intending to drive them from away uh, from the Red Fork of the Trident to free the lands and the old paths of, of the River Lords, who had recently sworn allegiance to him. He met, he met little serious resistance, as the Lannisters were already in the process of which withdrawing their forces to Aaron Hall in the Western Riverlands to regroup. Barely days after Joffrey was declared king, the faction backing his rule only held the Western Lands and the Crown Lands, as well as a small strip of the Southern land, Riverlands. Meanwhile, Robb Stark controlled the North and most of the Riverlands. Renly Baratheon controlled the Reach and the Stormlands, uh, were divided between the Baratheon brothers. Meanwhile, the other three kingdoms, the Vale, Dorne, and the Iron Islands, had not yet declared their support for any one side in the conflict. King Joffrey appointed his grandfather, Tywin Lannister, as the new Hand of the King. However, due to the previous situation of their forces, Tywin decided against going to King's Landing, and instead appointed his son, Tyrion Lannister, as acting Hand of the King. His task was to keep the king under control and prevent him from committing another mistake, such as Eddard Stark's execution, and to prepare King's Landing for an assault by the Baratheon forces in the south. When Tywin encamped at Harren Hall, some of these places are like tongue twisters, I swear. When Tywin encamped at Harren Hall, which was too strong a fortress to attack directly, Rob instead launched a limited invasion of the Lannister homelands in the west. He launched a surprise attack on the new Western Lands army gathering at the village of Oxcross, where new con conscripts were to be being trained or being trained to replace the Lannister army group destroyed by uh, destroyed at the Whispering Wood. Rob destroyed the Green Lannister army group in the resulting Battle of Oxcross, killing Sir Stafford Lannister in the process. The victory left the Western lands lightly defended. Rob went on to win a major victory at the Battle of the Yellow Thorn and force the surrender of the crag. With the Lannister homelands under attack and a Baratheon attack on King's Landing imminent, Tywin had difficult had a difficult choice to make. To ride out and meet Rob's forces in battle, abandoning their strong defensive position at Harrenhal, or to fall back on King's Landing and help defend the city from Stannis. I don't know why I sound like a flight attendant. Tywin eventually decided to ride west because of the threat 
Rob's forces posed to his stronghold at Casterly Rock. However, this was later revealed to be a ruse as Tywin was actually bringing his Lannister forces back to King's Landing. If you would like pretzels, please press the button to request a flight attendant to help you. We have a variety of water aboard. Tywin had already authorized secret negotiations with House Tyrell, the rulers of the Reach, to begin following Renly's death in the hope of winning an alliance with them and their powerful army. While Rob Stark took on, took part of his forces to invade the Western lands, the Western lands, most of the day to day fighting of the war continued in the Riverlands. All the territories between Riverrun on the Red Fork of the Trident River and Harrenhal at the north of the God's Eye Lake to the south were a uh, war zone facing raids and counter raids by Stark, Tully, and Lannister forces. Much of the Riverlands were devastated in the fighting. This culminated in battle in the Battle of the Stone Mill, in which Lord Edmure Tully preemptively attacked the Lannister army by Lord Gregor Clegane, which was massing to cross the Red Fork. Um, Edmure inflicted two to one casualties, and the Lannisters withdrew. Lord Tywin's younger nephews, Willem and Martin Lannister, were also captured. However, while this was a tactical victory, it was a strategic failure. Rob Stark's actual grand strategy had been to evade the Western lands in order to lure the Lannisters back away from King's Landing, then lure them into a trap so that Gregor's army could be surrounded and destroyed. Instead, Gregor's army was temporarily defeated but left mostly intact allowing the Lannister forces in the Riverlands to regroup and then leave Arenhal to rush to defense of the King's Landing when Stannis, Stannis, when Stannis Baratheon later attacked. Um, Robb Stark blamed uh, Edmure for not waiting to lure Gregor into a trap to the west, even though Robb gave him no clear orders that this was his intention. The death of Renly Baratheon, Stannis Baratheon, and his younger brother Renly Baratheon both claimed the Iron Throne of Westeros. Stannis had a small army at Dragonstone and was influenced by Melisandre, a red priestess of the Lord of Light, uh, and a powerful sorceress, while Renly amassed the strength of his bannermen in the Stormlands and those of the Reach by marrying Marjorie Tyrell, daughter of uh, Macy Tyrell. By this point, Renly's faction was the most powerful in terms of sheer numbers. He could call upon over half the bannermen of the Stormlands, as well as the armies of the Reach, the most populous region of the West of Westeros. However, Renly refused to take decisive action, relying on his popularity to draw more supporters to his cause while his enemies destroyed one another. Renly was receptive to an alliance with the Stark Tully faction and indeed sympathized with their cause, but insisted that Rob recognize Renly's continued sovereignty, sovereignty over the North in return for an alliance against Joffrey and the Lannisters. Unfortunately for the Starks, Renly was assassinated before any deals could be made. During a failed summit between the rival Baratheon brothers, Stannis gives an ultimatum to Renly to pledge his loyalty before he attacks. But Renly defies and disrespects him. Unconcerned due to the small size of Stannis' army, Melisandre gives birth to a shadow which later enters Renly's tent and kills him. While the Reach army leaves for Highgarden on the orders of the Tyrells, Renly's stormlords swear fealty to Stannis as the remaining legal head of House Baratheon. With a formidable army, with a formidable army of Stormlanders and a Dragonstone fleet now at his command, Stannis prepares for an invasion of King's Landing. Um, okay, and I um just realized.
realized that the War of the Five Kings is insanely fucking long. Um, halfway through reading it, so I'm going to cut it short there, and we're just going to move on to the conflict beyond the wall. Um, mostly because I want, I don't want this whole video to be just about the War of the Five Kings. Although, if I had known, I could have made a specifically specific video just for that, but there's always next time. So, I hope that doesn't, uh, irk you that I'm jumping around a little bit. But, you know, this is more interesting, so let's do it. The conflict beyond the wall refers to an interconnected conflict prior to the Great War, primarily taking place beyond the wall in the northern reaches of the Seven Kingdoms. The mightiest and oldest defense structure constructed by mankind. When the wall was raised at the end of the legendary war for the dawn, its main purpose was to shield the realms of men against the possible future return of the White Walkers, a supernatural race of beings who emerged during the long night, a cold and dark winter that lasted a generation and hunted all in their path, raising the dead as whites. Since then, the night's watch was stood guard for about 8,000 years, defending Westeros from threats that lurk beyond it in the far north. Over the hundreds of centuries, its initial task has generally been forgotten. Sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> With most believing the White Walkers to be nothing more than folklore, and fewer believing they are simply extinct. Instead, the Night's Watch has been guarding the realm against the human free folk, whom the Southerners despairingly call wildlings, who live on the frozen lands beyond. Occasionally, forming raiding parties, the wildlings consistently try to cross the wall into the richer and warmer lands to the south of the wall. Recently, however, their efforts have been concentrated into escaping the mysterious and sudden return of the reawakened White Walkers of the northernmost lands of Always Winter and their new and ever-growing Army of the Dead. The events of this conflict take place in the far north of Westeros, and are thus, and are thus, are known of considered unimportant. This is a weird sentence. Let me read that back to you again. The events of this conflict take place in the far north, far forth of Westeros, and are thus, are unknown or considered unimportant to the majority of the Westerosi population, especially with the War of the Five Kings ravaging throughout the Seven Kingdoms. As some are beginning to see, however, the events beyond the wall are the true conflict that will shake the continent. With the growing power of the White Walkers and their Night King threatening to bring about the Long Night once again. And, uh, that is something that, you know, I found quite interesting is the fact that you have basically these ice zombies that are around the corner and nobody seems to care, nobody seems to be paying attention, everyone's kind of just fighting for the throne, but it's not really going to matter much once the Night King comes for all of you, you know. So, it's interesting, um, and I know the season finale is going to address this whole issue. I won't say anything more if you're not caught up. I mean, if you're not, you shouldn't be watching this video, but I, you know, I'm very against spoilers, so. I will say no more. I will, however, uh, upload a discussion video talking about the finale um, once it's aired. So that'll be another video that's Game of Thrones related. So stay tuned for that. I've been thinking about doing more of those kind of videos, you know, discussion videos. Could be fun. Before Aegon Targaryen's conquest of Westeros, the Night's Watch boasted 19 castles along hundreds leagues of the wall along hundred leagues of the wall with a strength of over 10,000 men at arms castle black alone 
quartering, quartering 5,000 fighting men with all their horses, servants, and equipment. But its manpower has dwindled during the last 300 years to the point that the Watch has only managed to sustain three castles. Castle Black, located in the middle of the wall with about 600 men. The Shadow Tower at the far west of the wall, overlooking the mountains with about 200 men. And the Coastal East Watch on the shores of the Shivering Sea with even fewer men. A bare third of them are fighting men. The 997th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, Gior Marmot, was deeply concerned by the declining power of the Watch and the rising threat of the wildlings beyond the wall, um, whose raids have increased on the people south of the wall in recent years. Unbeknownst to the Night's Watch, this was due to the return of the White Walkers, an ancient enemy of mankind that had been long, that had been gone for around 8,000 years since the Long Night. Mormont implemented a random system of patrols, varying the number of patrols and the days of their departure, in order to prevent the wildlings slipping past the guard. At times, the old bear would also send a larger force to one of the abandoned castles for a fortnight of a moon's turn as well. Around the beginning of the conflict, beyond the wall, the Seven Kingdoms had erupted in a major civil war, known as the War of the Five Kings, partly caused by tensions carried over from Robert's Rebellion and the Greyjoy Rebellion. Decades earlier, the realm later became embroiled in Daenerys Targaryen's invasion of Westeros as well. Thus, the southern kingdoms, including the north itself, for a time were preoccupied with their own Game of Thrones, while the undermanned and under-equipped Night's Watch looked down upon by most of the realm in modern times struggled to hold back the perils that persisted beyond the wall. The great raging Ranging. After reports of wildlings amassing, rumors of white walkers being slighted, the disappearance of several rangers, including First Ranger Benjamin Stark, and the appearance of whites, a force of nearly 300 men of the Night's Watch, embarked on a great ranging led by the Lord Commander himself. The purpose of the ranging was to investigate the various rumors of those concerning wildlings, who, while normally unorganized, were flocking to the call of the king beyond the wall, Mance Raider, a former brother of the Night's Watch, and those concerning the recurrent re recurrence uh, of mythical white walkers. While trekking north, the ranging party reached uh, Greyster's Keep, where Greyster confirmed that a vast wildling army was amassing in the Frostfang Mountains prepared to strike um, the wall. Mormont then resolved to march north to attack the wildling host before he reached the wall. <clears throat> His army then erected a base of operations at the Fist of the First Men, an ancient elm fort. While on the Fist, Mormont's force was reinforced by a group of rangers led by Corrin Halfhand, Halfhand, a legendary ranger to mount a scouting operation into wildling territory to gather information about the enemy. Jon Snow, until then personal steward to the Lord Commander, volunteered to go with them. However, this mission ended up badly when Jon walked into a wildling trap and was captured. Later on, Quarren was also taken prisoner. Realizing a last-minute opportunity, Quarren ordered Jon Snow to kill him to prove his loyalty to the wildling cause. And so, to infiltrate their ranks to gather intelligence for the Watch. Because of his killing of Quarren and his relation to the wildling girl Egret, John was uh, accepted into the wildling ranks. Meanwhile, on the Fist of the First Men, his brothers of the Watch discovered a hidden cache of mysterious dragon class. Battle of the Fist of the First Men. Of the Fist 
the first map. Sorry, got distracted. And expecting a return of the scouting mission of Orn Afan, the base of the Night's Watch was beset by an army of whites led by the legendary White Walkers themselves. This was the first confrontation between men and White Walkers in thousands of years. The Watch suffered massive casualties and had to abandon its position. Most of its fighting strength was depleted, and the dead men were later reanimated as more whites for the undead army. Lord Commander Mormont managed to retreat south, but many of his survivors were injured, uh, starving, and thoroughly shaken. Mutiny at Craster's Keep The ragged remains of the Night's Watch army eventually arrived back at Craster's Keep where the tensions between Host and his guests became increasingly hostile. When Craster's Keep refused them food and offered to finish uh, the injured, he was goaded into a rage by the ranger Carl and then stabbed through the throat. Mormont was unable to control the ensuing chaos and was stabbed in the back by, a, by the disgruntled Rast. With the Lord Commander dead, the surviving brothers of the Watch started fighting amongst themselves. In the aftermath, only a handful of loyal brothers made their way back to Castle Black, while the mutineers uh, settled in, a, in at Craster's Keep, turning it even more into a house of horrors. Raid on Craster's Keep The mutineers of the Night's Watch were eventually dealt with, and eliminated in an expedition led by Jon Snow. To prevent any information about the weakness of the defenses of the Night's Watch leaking to Man's Raider, Raider's approaching army, with this, the death of the Lord Commander Mormont was avenged, and Craster's Keep was burned to the ground in the aftermath. Weeks after having climbed the wall, Tormon's warband, including Ygritte, was joined by Stir and his Then Raiders, and started to raid towns in the Gift, eventually reaching Molestown, a small village close to Castle Black. The wildlings killed everyone in sight. Battle of Castle Black Mance Raider led a siege against the grievously undermanned Castle Black, signaling the attack by starting a massive conflagration of north of the wall. His attack was twofold. His main army, composed of wildlings, giants, and mammoths, attacked the north side of the wall, while the smaller garrison that had climbed the wall launched a surprise attack on Castle Black's southern entrance. Despite being hopelessly outnumbered, the men of the Night's Watch managed to repel the initial invasion and the small wildling garrison attacking from the south was nearly wiped out, resulting in the deaths of both Stir and Ygritte, and Tormond uh, began be being taken a prisoner of the Night's Watch. Although the initial invasion was repealed, uh, repelled, Castle Black's garrison took a significant number of casualties. Gren and Pi Piper, 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 among them, Mance was simply testing Castle Black's defenses and planned to launch a much larger counterattack. In hopes of preventing this from happening, Jon Snow decided to venture north of the Wall and assassinate Mance Raider, in hopes that his death would unravel the unity amongst the Wildling clans and end the war. Through, uh, though Jon knew this was unlikely to be, this was likely to be a suicide mission. While John was treating uh, with Mance Raider the following morning, hundreds of mounted knights, led by Stannis Baratheon, arrived, taking the Wildling army by surprise. The Wildling camps were quickly overrun, scattering thousands of Wildlings into the wilderness while the majority were rounded up and captured by Stannis' troops. Stannis then took up residence in Castle Black, alongside his court and the knights watch and okay i think we're gonna stop here uh for today to be honest i underestimated just how much there was going to be in the second half of this video 
because when I read uh, the lore in the first video, if, if you remember, if you watched it, it was a lot shorter. This one had a lot more information, wasn't prepared for it, um, and I don't want this video to go too long. Um, so that means that there will be more Game of Thrones lore, which is a good thing. I will continue reading this. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching, my friends. And uh, I hope you're looking forward to the season finale of the Game of Thrones as much as I am. It's going to be really, really awesome. Um, but yeah, until then, I'll see you in the next video. And I look forward to discussing the finale with all of you. Um, take care, guys. See you later.